Welcome to the Kings Beat Podcast. I am James Ham, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the Kings Beat. Joining me today, Box 40, Sean Cunningham. Sean, how are you? I am pretty fantastic. Uh, got a little break in this weather. Went from those triple digits to some really great 90 degree weather that I love. And uh, back from Vegas, it, where I think we brought the heat. Brennan and I brought the heat back from Vegas because it was like triple digits for the last few days. But I got to tell you, probably one of the more enjoyable Vegas uh, weather that you could have. Because, James, we've been down there. It's 115, 116 degrees. That didn't that happened for about two days of my seven down there. So most of it was pretty tolerable, I felt. What about you, Brendan? Tolerable. Well, yeah, for me, Vegas standard. I have to introduce him. Oh, also, hi, Brendan. Also Oops. joining us. Brendan Nunes from the Kings Bulls podcast. Brendan, how are you? I'm Go ahead and good. talk Vegas. Yeah, Vegas wasn't too bad heat wise. Um, I can't believe Sean complains nonstop about the rain, but sits here and talks about how he loves the heat. I don't know what's wrong with heat. this guy, um, especially when you're wearing all black all the time. You're a psycho. That's uh, I don't really have anything. I got a I got a podcast candle going on. Sean, while we were in Vegas shows me his phone and he's like guess what and this guy got a whole shipment of podcast candles you got sure a did. shipment like well free or did that. you order them no did you know we just sponsor uh, you we don't, I definitely don't have a sponsor but <laughs> mine is a by fight club candles blue <laughs> lavender breeze going this one today what do you got over there brendan uh, a waterfall which did you know waterfalls have a smell apparently clearance sticker still on it and a sticker now let's see your yours again, Sean. Uh, mine's got the three wick going. I don't know if I can. Ooh. Okay, so this, hold it up a little bit. It, hold it up. Okay, hold it up. It, you know what that looks like? It looks like the uh, at the doctor's office when you were a kid. You go in and they had that sand thing that you can keep flipping over, and it just kind of like. Oh yeah, those are fun. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Maybe Brendan doesn't. Maybe they don't. Brendan they didn't have those little, when Brendan like was a little hourglass of the sand and had all the little. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's you usually know, like a flat ones. board that you could sit there and move and then just do like the, the ripple effect. All right. Uh, okay, so if you are watching here on YouTube and you don't mind, uh, can you give us a thumbs up? Sure. Um, can you subscribe? That would be okay. nice. Uh, if you are listening somewhere else, if you don't mind, give us a rating and review. Those things help us. Um, if you're just hanging out and we're in the dog days of summer, um, jump on board with the Kings beat, especially with what's happening on social media. Social media right now is like wackadoodle, uh, between Twitter and then threads and then everyone's back to Twitter. And I'm not quite sure what's going to happen here, but, uh, it's a good way to get all of your news just dropped right into your inbox and you don't have to go chase it. Um, and I've actually been, uh, signing up for more, uh, you know, like again, Mark Stein has a sub stack, which is absolutely, uh, spectacular. Um, there are a few others, a soccer one that I've been following, um, like the whole, uh, beehive or Substack thing. It's really cool. It's a good way to get your info without having to look for it. Uh, so jump on board of the King's beat, become a premium subscriber. I think we're going to do a happy hour a week from today on Thursday. What is Thursday? The 27th. Um, uh, I got to get a guest. Uh, we're still working on that, but, uh, we're going to have a happy hour, um, because I think that makes sense. Uh, and hopefully these two fine gentlemen can join me on that that happy hour. Uh, but lots going on uh, and nothing going on all at the same time. Um, we've got some things to mull over and talk about here. Uh, let's get to uh, let's get to just what are your guys' final thoughts on the uh, the summer league experience? Everything from top to bottom. Like, was there something that stood out to you? Uh, something that you enjoyed uh, that you didn't think you would with this roster? Uh, last year's roster was uh, maybe a little more entertaining. The first couple games of Summer League were uh, a lot better watching experience than maybe the last few. But I think that there were interesting things to take from some of the returning guys. I thought we saw the two ways make some progress. Previous year's two ways, Keon Ellis and Mia Skata make some progress. Um, saw kind of about, in my mind, as expected from Kobe Jones. Jalen Slauson got to do a little bit more in that last game when a lot of guys sat. Um, and not the greatest showing from Kessler Edwards, but I think that, you know, maybe the context isn't the best for him to show his game. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I have too many big picture things we haven't touched on before. I, I do think that Luke Laux did a very good job and as did 
Dutch Gately and Davida Stolkes and the other guys on that staff that were able to get a little bit more opportunity as a coaching staff. And Luke talked to me about how he thinks it's going to make him a better assistant going into next year. So I think overall, just everybody got to expand their horizons a little bit and try to show a little bit of something new. Yeah. I, I think journalistically, the, the, the thing that was most uh, uh, interesting um aside from you know you sitting down and watch some guys like like Colby Jones and and Jalen Slauson and uh you know with a little bit more of a f- of a finer eye if you will as opposed to see what what you can see on tape from college or what you remember of him at Xavier and uh, you know none of us had watched any Furman basketball so um a, a one from, tournament game excuse you you're right <laughs> actually you're right that was a very uh a very prominent game uh from last season so yeah uh with respect i I apologize um but i I think journalistically i you know the most interesting thing was the interactions with luke laux um day in and day out because i felt uh he was very honest he was he was very refreshing to talk to there was a lot of um uh, analysis i think there was a lot of um uh, recognizing not only the moment for summer league for some of these guys, but uh, the big picture as well. And I, I felt, uh, if, you know, any interaction was hit with him was was um, very eye opening, and and you kind of learn something each time that you were talking to him. You get a kind of a fresh perspective on the team and where they're at, and and different players on the team. Uh, I, I feel like uh, him really appreciative of the moment was really kind of shined through with the uh particularly at the end uh, you know i left um right before their final game that saturday i left that friday night and uh just kind of speaking to him after the second to last game in vegas um you know he really kind of opened up about appreciating what mike brown um giving him the opportunity opening him some doors giving him some exposure i uh you know there was he, he you know there's several moments even for him where he's looking back at the game and saying, yeah, I should have challenged this. I should have done certain things uh, that, that in hindsight he would have done differently. And <laughs> I told him, I said, there, there was a moment where, you know, Colby, Colby Jones takes a big fall. Right. And if you don't call the timeout, which I, I can't remember how many they had left at the time, uh, you, you kind of have to call the timeout or burn it or uh, get assessed a technical. I looked at him. I said, why not take the technical, you know, <laughs> we'll give, give your guy all the time he needs to whatever. And he's like, yeah, I probably should have. And I was like, Hey, at least you get your name in the box score at that point to, to show that you were a coach and yeah, you were a factor, but uh, there were, there were just little fun moments like that. Uh, I thought, um, you know, I, I really, I told you guys last week and Brendan, I think you can attest to this. Uh, I, I really enjoy watching Colby Jones. Uh, I thought he has a, a poise, a comfortability that, you don't see a lot in in summer league from a lot of people, especially second round picks. And I thought he looked like among one of the most comfortable people on the court throughout all the games, even with other teams that I saw down in Vegas. Um, so really enjoyed that, uh, I, you know. And I think that was something that you also saw in the California Classic. Um, him just looking very, very calm, poised, uh, not looking like a moment is too big. Doesn't look like a deer in the headlights. Doesn't look like things are happening too fast for him to catch up he just looked like he belonged i thought that was a very uh very positive sign for him you know somebody like jalen slauson i think that's especially comparative to him the moment was might have been a little too much for him and i think you're going to see some some progression from him as time goes on him already having a two-way contract and and that's fine you know him having to be able to get into training camp with this team and, and I, and ideally play a big role with Stockton and, and show some of that progression and show that he can uh, develop. I mean, that's, that's what it's going to be about for him. So obviously Jordan Ford was, it was a huge bright spot. You know, you had good moments from guys like Mike Dom, who um, I don't know that we thought we would be saying his name at any point during summer league, but certainly we I think Kings fans got to know him a little bit. And uh, yeah, I, I'm with you, Brendan. I think that it, it was a little unfortunate that the Kings didn't have a more sexy schedule against some teams with some uh, some 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 meat on the bone or or some real uh, you know proven talent or or guys that you know in comparison to last year when you had Keegan Murray playing and he's going up against both 
Paolo Van Carroll one night, Chet Holmgren the next night, and Jabari Smith uh, a night after. Uh, that was certainly entertaining. So comparatively, this one was not as uh, entertaining from that standpoint. But I think you learned a lot about some of the players uh, that that could be in the mix uh, for for roster spots who could be members of the Stockton Kings and possibly for two way players. And um, yeah, I don't think that from an evaluation standpoint for someone like Namias Keda or even Keon Ellis, I don't think too much was learned. I think you knew a lot what you had seen from guys like that, but um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to digest there, but uh, I think overall very positive experience. You go, you know, five and two, I think overall in the uh, summer league experience. And I think they got to be happy about that. I'll add real quick on Colby that like I was also impressed, but it is no like I was surprised looking back at the four games he played. He shot 39% from the field and 23% from three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that like that's where the danger of summer league is, right? Like when you start digging into the numbers, because guys are going to look substantially different when they're playing with higher end talent. And, you know, Colby Jones at the NBA level, if he does get to play at all this year, He's never going to be anyone that you game plan for. He's going to have all kinds of wide open looks because that's what happens when you're a young player. And uh, if they put him on the court, the focus will shift to, you know, Fox or, or depending on who he's playing with Monk, Sabonis, you know, the, the, like the spotlight will shift to them. So um, I, it's a little difficult to judge like what a guy is doing in summer league, uh, especially with, you know, just the, the overall talent level. Um, when we talk about, uh, Slauson though, I wasn't impressed with Slauson at all through the first like six games. I thought he didn't stand out at all. I thought he looked exactly like some of the players that they brought in last year. Like it was a Jariah horn and like they, they just had like a handful of guys that they brought in. I thought the final game, he actually got to show who he can be a little bit, but my first instincts were number one, he needs a training staff. Like I think there's more athletically for him. Uh, there's more that he can become as far as like, you know, a lot like Nami Keda. Nami Keda came in and needed a bunch of work on his body. I, I feel the same way about Slauson. And you started to see sort of the outline of who he could be, but I, I still came away after the entirety of, of the seven days thinking, uh, the seven games thinking, I'm still surprised they gave him a two-way contract like off the jump. Like I, I almost would have liked to have seen them you know sort of play it out and see how it looks through summer league and then decide what to do with him um but that's not what they decided uh, do you guys have the same feeling or you're like okay look he's got enough there's enough there to like and you know the shot blocking the defensive acumen the fact that he was a defensive player of the year at one point in college even if it was at a lower division college um but like what were your takeaways yeah i think a lot of the stuff that like you just mentioned there james stuff that he's already got on paper is going to speak you know, volumes louder than the the sample size of seven ge- summer league games, and uh, you know, I, I agree with you. He did not he he stood out in a negative way where it looks like oh man, this this looks like it could be quite an adjustment, and I think it will be. I think you know he even had some. You can see he he's he's got a little edge to him. He, he he's talks to the officials. He talks to his coaches. He talks to his teammates. Um, he sh- he plays with some emotion. Uh, I don't think that's a negative i think some people might look at that as a negative and say oh he complains a lot or he's doing this or that or he's kind of a hothead he picked up a you know a technical at one point i i like that i like the emotion uh it shows me he cares um shows me that you know he's frustrated with his own play and i think he would tell you that so i i think a lot of the accolades that he has on paper is what earns him that um that that two-way and and certainly things change really quickly in the nba but but i i do believe for him and it'll be interesting to see if they do the same thing with him that they did with Kata that first year where they kept Kata around the big team a lot uh I kind of hope not because I'd like to see him you know play in Stockton and and get a lot of reps um but all the while realizing that staying around your parent club uh and, and being around the Sacramento team is important for somebody's development even off the court is how to be a professional and I think you know I I will agree. I don't, I don't think he stood out in terms of his play. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that make you scratch your head. But again, uh, there, there's things that they liked him. They liked him enough to draft him. And uh, some of the things that he did to stand out, I think there's just a, a long way to go for him in his development. 
Yeah, and Brennan, I'm going to bring this up. Like all the stuff that Sean just talked about, I think it's really cool because like at, at Cox Pavilion, you're like right next to these guys. Like you're in their business. I mean, it's such a small gym and you see the things that Sean talked about where he's talking to his teammates, where he's hard on himself, where he's, he's talking to the officials. And I think that that's like the on the ground thing that, um, that we don't even really get at the California classic, like the California classic. We're so far removed from the court. Um, just what was your takeaway seeing like being that close and, and watching him in, in the, uh, in the Vegas setting? Yeah. I mean, one of the things he talked about after I think two games into Vegas, um, is that, you know, there's an adjustment that, especially talking about compared to Furman, where he spent five years, that there's a big adjustment to everybody being as big, athletic, and strong as him. And, and he talked about how that is kind of taking some time. And and you can see that by being close, like you're talking about, like the physicality of some of these games, the size of all of these guys, and just how quick everything is happening, I, I think, to me, seemed like it was an adjustment for J- Slauson. Um, you saw that. I think seeing growth throughout the course of seven games is encouraging, though. I I think that he was approaching it the right way. You saw him grow more comfortable, and it it just looked a step slow to everything on both ends. He started to get some of the defensive rotations towards the back end. He had some interesting playmaking stuff at Furman that I think he got to show a little bit more in that last game than maybe he did in games prior. Um, I like that he's getting the three-point shots up. Uh, He doesn't seem very hesitant to take them. They're not going down at an amazing rate, but I like that he's willing to take them. Um, I think that there's an, a positional adjustment for him as well. So I, I think a lot of it is just being a step slow, adjusting to the NBA game and no longer being a guy that can just get by on being the you know biggest, strongest, fastest guy that he's up against. Yeah. I mean, like, look, over the course of time here in Sacramento, we've seen plenty of players come from smaller schools and it's something that, you know, it just depends on what coach or, I mean, what GM, GM was running the team. But um, there are some things that, like, I'll point out. And and it's sort of the same conversation with Nimi Keita. Like, Nimi Keita, first of all, came to basketball late. Secondly, he went to a very, like, a smaller school in Utah State. And it reminds me a lot of, like, when Jason Thompson came into the league uh, from Ryder. And, like, you can't. Jason Thompson at Ryder was able to get away with all kinds of things, right? He's a six foot 10, six foot 11 power forward slash center. He could shoot. Uh, When he got to the league, his feet face the wrong way on his jump shot. Like they literally like he's shooting at a basket straight and his feet are aimed over here. Um, Every time he's in the post, he would bring the ball down low and big uh, like that's something you can get away with when you're bigger, stronger and, and more athletic than everybody else. But at the pro level, you bring a ball down low in the post and that's where all the guards are hanging out and swipe the ball from you. And it's just something he had to learn. And and maybe he didn't even learn a lot of those bad habits uh, like three, four years into his career. So I think playing at a smaller school, like, like Slauson, it does come with some, and, and again, the same thing with Namia and Namias, like there are certain things that he wasn't able to come in as like, and understand and had to learn as opposed to just, you know, working on their body, they have other things like the speed, the quickness, everything else. Those are things that we, we put out there as like, like the large scale things that he has to work with, but it's also the finer nuances of the game that you get away with when the talent level you're playing against is at a lower standard as well. So um, I'm intrigued to see what he does at Stockton and see how he grows. Um, again, he's a 23 year old. Uh, they signed him to a one year, two way contract from what I can tell. And that's, it's kind of like you're taking a gamble on a guy, but it's not that big of a gamble. Um, I, it's just whether or not you missed on someone else that was there at that point in the draft. And so let's, uh, let's transition from what we saw at Vegas. Well, I mean, maybe not. Uh, we're, what do we make of the Namias Keda situation? And I, I think what we're at at, at this point, um, Sacramento Kings have added Nerland so well. We'll get to that discussion a little bit later. Uh, because we can talk about what he brings to the table. But the fact that they just brought in another player at the center position when you already had Demona Sabonis, uh, Trey Lyle scheduled to play, small ball five, Alex Lynn on the roster. I don't know that that means good things for Namias Keda, and I'm not sure that it means that he's done here in Sacramento. Uh, but I've also heard some murmurs of European teams looking at him, kicking the tires on him, um, and 
I think that there's a a major league, like what's going to happen here with Namias Keda. You spent two years sort of bringing him along, and then all of a sudden, uh, I, I don't know that where he's at in as part of the program. Um, so, like, what are your what are your guys' thoughts? Uh, let's go. Let's go with uh, Brendan. Um, have we seen the last of Namias Keda in Sacramento? Um, I, I think a two way would still make sense, but I'd imagine that if he was willing to do that. I would think that that would have already happened, but I don't know. Um, I think a two-way makes sense still, but a roster spot does not. And I do think the Noel signing, um, as you mentioned, also with Trey Lyles and Alex Len and obviously DeMontis Sabonis in that starting spot, does kind of leave him on the outside looking in. Um, And he showed some things in summer league, but nothing really all too new. I mean, I, I still think that we've seen progress from Kata since he's joined the league, which is encouraging bigs take a long time traditionally. So there's still intrigue there, but I don't think that he's been so good that it's like, Oh man, if you let this guy go, you're really going to regret it. You know, that's not the spot where I'm at with Kata right now. Um, I think that still developing him and giving him that two way could make sense, but doesn't really make sense for that last roster spot for me. Sean. Yeah, I mean, I'm right there with you. Um, I, I think, you know, you don't, you're don't, you not hearing of a lot of teams coming knocking on the door trying to give this guy an offer. So, um, you know, the Kings have the, the, the right to match anything, and uh, it's, been, it's been quiet. There's no offer sheet there. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, if it, if it is a two-way, fantastic for him um, and, and good for them. I feel like his development has, has gone well. It's just it's not – to the point where you're comfortable to, to give him rotational minutes or even, you know, the, the, even being a, a third center at this point. I mean, obviously with going with somebody like Alex Len and, and Nerlens Noel, that shows you what they're, they're thinking there in terms of their big men and their rotations and uh, uh, having trust in some veteran pieces as opposed to somebody who's still uh, very green in their NBA development. So, um, would another year as a two-way player benefit him? Uh, I, I think I think it could, but there could be greener pastures out there and more lucrative um, opportunities out there overseas. It doesn't mean his NBA dream would be over at that point. Certainly he could go do that and come back at some point and land with an NBA team, and hell, it could be in Sacramento a, a, at a certain point. But um, I think he's a uh, – the likelihood – if you were – if I had a uh, – you know, pick your destiny here for, for, uh, <laughs> for Namias Keda. And I was forced to make a decision. I would probably say that, um, he's going to go with whatever's the most lucrative for him. I mean, he, you know, he's, uh, I would bet on him if he's got an overseas opportunity, uh, and if it's truly more lucrative than what he can take in the NBA side. And we're talking by like leaps and bounds. I don't think if it's like, a little bit more than what a two-way contract would look like, then at that point, I think he probably still rolls the dice with the NBA and hopefully, you know, latches on with a two-way, be it in Sacramento or elsewhere. But um, I think if he's got a substantial offer, he has to take that. And I would almost bet on that happening. But uh, that's pure speculation on my my part. I don't know that. I think he's got a big question mark around him. Uh, I I don't even know that the Kings would necessarily want to give him that final two-way, but I think that the roster spot would be off the table. Yeah, so I'll just kind of break down. He's kind of in a weird contractual situation as well. So because he spent two years on a two-way with the same team, they gave him a qualifying offer, and it's – it's tied up as a two way qualifying offer, but it's really not like right. the way it works is that it's a, if they do, if he just accepts a qualifying offer, he basically gets a, uh, a standard NBA contract, but with only $75,000 guaranteed. And so it's, it's kind of a mess for him. And uh, the two way contract is 550,000. So it's a lot more money. And uh, like, if he's going to go to Europe, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that he might make like, if he's going to Spain um, and there's also uh, a a team in, and I want to say partisan Belgrade, I've heard that is interested. Um, So like, there's like a possibility that he would go and get like pretty substantial money. I don't know what that means though, because I mean, we're seeing what Sasha Pazenkov made uh, before last season. I mean, he was at like 800,000 bucks playing in Greece. 
So like a two-way contract might make sense. But I, I am kind of surprised that there aren't other NBA teams that are looking at a two-way contract for him. My opinion is this. If the Kings were a a team that they were at any point of the last 16 seasons before last year, then he could probably be your third center. Like that's, that's the way it goes. Like if, you know, the 2018 Sacramento Kings had Namias Keda, he would probably be your third center and he might even get some burn. But the fact that you're a 48 win team, you start looking at your roster differently and your development differently and where players are and whether they can come in and play right away and all that. I still think Namias Keda has like a, a pretty solid future. And I actually like him in Sacramento. I like what he, his skill set, what he does. I, I just think he needs another year and that's unfortunate, but that's, that's just where I'm at. Like with him as, as a player, I just don't know. He's going to get that shot, especially with the way that everything else has kind of played out here. So um, let's get to, it, it, that brings us more to the Nerlens Noel situation. Now, Brennan has been high on Nerlens forever. Uh, Sean and I have uh, our own opinions on Nerlens. Uh, <laughs> but I, I just want to make sure we don't know what Nerlens contract is right now. So people are saying like, oh, well, you know, I just. Well, you know me... what it could be. Let's just say that. You you know what it has potential of being. Well, it has potential don't know... of being. Yeah, it's a lead yeah. minimum contract, right? So Correct. it's $3.1 million. We know what the dollar amount is. It's it's basically, it's the same contract Alex Len side. It's, it's a league minimum contract for a player with X amount of years of service, right? Right. So, but we don't know if it's guaranteed money or not. We don't know how much guaranteed money is there. So I would be surprised if the whole entirety of it was guaranteed. I'm not sure that Alex Lenz contract is 100% guaranteed, but I think that it is. But with Nerlens, like, look, this is a guy who got waived last year uh, and signed a 10-day contract with somebody, and he was out there. So I, I would be surprised if it wasn't more something similar to the Della Vadova contract uh, that we saw from last year where he makes X amount of money if he makes opening night roster. He, if he doesn't make the opening net roster, he might get at like 125,000. If he does make it, he gets a bump up to 250. If he makes it past the, Ju the January 20th deadline where rosters, uh, where these uh, non guaranteed contracts have to be guaranteed, um, you know, then he would get all of the money. That's where I'm kind of at. I I'm, but I'm speculating because I, I don't know. And I've touched base with a couple of people and haven't heard anything specific. Um, but I don't know. Brandon, why don't you tell us what what Nerlens you think Nerlens brings to this team and why he's a player that you've circled that you like over the last couple of uh, over the last season or so? Yeah, just to be clear, when I really liked him last season, it was oh, as a buyout candidate. I wasn't <laughs> like this is a guy that it was a center situation that you know it's a lot of the same centers in the room to be honest, but that was very up in the air, needed to be figured out, and it's like maybe you just try this guy. I liked him as something you try. Um, I still think that there's interesting aspects here. I mean, rim protection is probably going to be the biggest thing that Nerlens Noel provides. Um, he has not played much in the last handful of years. There's that 10 day you mentioned that he signed with Brooklyn. He played three games, um, went back and watched those. It's hard to take anything from a 10 day a guy. Didn't play much um, prior to that in Detroit because of all the bigs they have on that roster. Um, also, if he was just really good enough he would have still got into the rotation despite all the bigs but Jalen Duran, um James Wiseman Isaiah Stewart Marvin Bagley um, and then prior to that there's 25 games he played with New York in 21 22 and then the last time he played a good significant chunk of a season was 64 games again for the Knicks in 2020 21 um, so there's definitely intrigue here I think he moves the floor well again that rim protection he's a guy that um, seems to be willing to embrace a role at this point in his career. And uh, yeah, some intrigue, but you still have the same issues as last year at the center spot in my mind. I, I think there's interesting things here. He could bring something different, but it is very hypothetical. Yeah. What are those, in what are those uh, issues there, Brendan? Uh, well, health. I, I think that also the rim protection is, sometimes hit and miss you know there's the balance of just not fouling um i think that offensively he talked about when he got to brooklyn like oh i'm just gonna kind of set screens and play my role and sure that's great you're not great at setting screens um and offensively what are you really gonna 
do, especially in a system that asks the bigs to be moving around a lot and sometimes making decisions. I don't think he's that sort of guy. Um, and the rebounding is not phenomenal with him either. So, you know, a guy that can move really well, defend pick and roll ideally in a couple different ways and protect the rim and help. But th- there's a reason this guy took as long as he did to end up somewhere, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, I think he nailed it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not his biggest fan, but he certainly addresses a need in theory. But rotationally, like I just don't see him uh, really adding much to the puzzle there. Like I don't see him as a factor night in, night out. In fact, I think you could go many games without seeing him even play if he were to get past training camp. And I, and, and I do, if I was to bet, I would say this is a non-guaranteed contract. Now, it's interesting in the sense with the Mia Skeda, and I think there's going to be decisions made likely before training camp as it as it pertains to him but let's just pretend both of them are in camp and i think in a perfect world uh if you're somehow able to beat out nerland's noel then maybe kata gets the roster spot and they just wave nerland's noel you know i think that's likely that, that could be a situation that could be likely and at that point um alex lens your your quasi backup or your three and then kata is on the roster and hopefully able to get some minutes at some point during the year to continue his uh, development. And of course you could still, James, I don't think I'm wrong here. You could still send him down to Stockton at that point at various times, much like they did with, um, you know, Ch- Ch- Chima Moneki last year. So uh, I could see that. And that to me kind of makes sense. I will say though, if that's whether it's Nerland's Noel on your roster or Nemeas Kata, I think your depth after, and I, I think if you listen to this podcast long enough, James and I, especially myself, talk about the difference between depth and quality depth. And I don't think you have a lot of quality depth at your center position. Um, Now, realizing that you go and play Trey Lyles at your center and you go small, we've seen what that looks like at times, and that's bared fruit, I think. But if this team was to really sustain an injury of significant time to somebody like Domas, like you're in a shitload of trouble. So uh, that's what I mean by quality depth with due respect to those players who work their ass off. Like, I just don't think that it's uh, a lot of NBA quality depth for sustained success. So uh, I think there's pieces there. And I think in a perfect world, if Noel can come in and boy, he just, you know, really impresses at practice, especially because there's really nobody on this team that can do what he does. Uh if that can, if he can make his mark that way, fantastic. And maybe he's got fresh legs for somebody who just hasn't really played a whole hell of a lot in recent years, and he's not that old, you know. So in theory, there could be a lot to like there. But if I was to bet on it, I wouldn't. Um, and I, I would bet you'd, it'd be pretty on par with what you've seen in in recent stops. So um, the concerns are there, um, but I think it's a low risk, uh, potentially decent reward if if he can you know, play well and bring some of those things to your team. Okay. So uh, there's like a bunch of things to cover here. Um, But I want to get to the quality of depth conversation, but I want to push it back to the end of like, let's, let's clarify some of the things that are happening here. Um, First and foremost, like there are things that Nerlin Noel does that like stand out, like for his career, he averages per 36, he averages 2.4 blocks per game. The, the bigger thing that in my opinion, is he averages 2.2 steals per 36. Like for as much as he is a shot blocker, he's actually a really good overall defensive player. And he's a guy who has good instincts. And the problem that you have is that he's more of a shot blocker than he is a defensive player against bigger centers. So if you have a situation where Demonis Sabonis gets in trouble and he gets and he, he's got to go sit because he's in foul trouble, um, that's a problem. Because uh, if you're going up against a big center, that's where Alex Lynn comes into play. Uh, if you're, you know, so I, I think that like having him on the roster, like would make some sense because he can block shots. He can get steals. I always value steals way above rim protection or, or blocks because blocks aren't a true turnover. Uh, like how many times do you get a block and it goes right out to a three point shooter or drills a three um, it, a steal is a true turnover. And that's where Nerlens Noel to me has always been really impressive. He's still raw offensively, but like, look, this is his seventh team since coming into the, what was it? 2013 draft, right? Uh, the Ben Mathmore draft, he goes to pick before. And the only reason he went to pick before was because he had blown out his knee and was going to miss his rookie season. So like, this is a guy that, that easily could have gone 
like one, two, three in that draft and, and would have gone one, two, three in that draft if it wasn't for an injury. The problems that I have is that like, he just never stands out, right? Like there are moments where he he's been an impactful player on a team, but it's very fleeting always. So the other thing I want to clear up is there's all it, like people go, okay, now the roster is at 14. They only have one more roster spot. That's not the case. Okay. So during the off season, you are allowed in typical years before this year, you are allowed to carry up to 20 players up until the day of opening night, right? Until the, the start of the regular season, then you have to make cuts because they've added a third two way player. Now you can carry up to 21 players on your roster during the off season. So that means that at the end of the day, you've got to have 15 or fewer on your, your active roster. You've got two or three, three ways, but then it, it kind of varies like how many players you can invite to camp. Like if you only have 14 rostered players and you only have two, two ways at 16, you can invite five guys to camp and, and you can sort of sift through these guys. But at that, that last moment, you got to make your cuts and get down to whatever. Um, so in theory, the Kings have 14 players on the roster, but they easily could, let's say they give Jordan Ford a, a, an invite to camp, but that invite, uh, it comes with some guaranteed money. Now he's a player on that roster and we start adding up players and, and figuring out how they're going to manage their two ways, how they're going to manage the regular roster. So the Kings, especially if New Orleans and Wells contract is not guaranteed, they don't have 14 men on the active roster right now. You know, they have somewhere, well, they have like 16 and they still have five more spots that they can fill between now and, uh, and you know, the end of training camp. So I just want to clarify that. Do you guys have any questions on that? Does that make sense? Did I no, describe that no, the right it's, way? It's good that you that you point that out for sure because uh, yeah, I think too many too many times you see people trying to fill up their depth chart and go, okay, well they're done. You know, it's like, no man, you're gonna have you're gonna have a lot of players in training camp as well, and you may um, you will already know essentially what your top twelve to fifteen players look like, but. Uh, it's you may walk into training camp with a two-way spot open. You may walk into training camp with a roster spot still open, and there will be uh, decisions that are going to be made. So uh, it, it's good that you say that. You mentioned Jordan Ford. He, I will tell you this, he will at least, at the very least, be in training camp. Um, whether or not he will be a two-way player or a roster player, he will at least have a training camp invite with this Kings team. So um that will be something you can bet on. And there will be other players that will join him uh, that you're going to start to hear, hopefully, within the not-too-distant future in the future. So, um, yeah, I think I think there's a lot of possibilities that exist and uh, decisions will be made, but they don't have to be made in August or July 20th. <laughs> yeah, you can look at OKC's roster right now, and I don't know the exact number, but they have a ridiculous amount of players on that roster. They just had to let go of Rudy Gay. Um, there's still other intriguing names to kind of keep tabs on, like Usman Garuba, Ty Ty Washington, Sean's favorite player in the league. Um, Ty, I would call him Ty Washington if he was, <laughs> if I had to cover him. I'm not calling him Ty Ty. Um, you know, there's there's interesting guys on that roster. And then just to think back uh, on last year's, like this, the guys we were talking about was Quinn Cook, Sam Merrill, Kent Bazemore, and you get sort of that same, potentially that same situation. So um, Sam yeah. Merrill, who, by the way, we were talking about Ball Summer League. League. Boy just totally showed i think he made the first team of summer league uh only, and of course won the championship as well so uh really really played well he's a good player like he's just right on the cusp he's that 4a player that's like bouncing back and forth whether he's a roster whether he can make it or not um yeah so brendan you bring up a good point uh okay see also uh robinson earl right that's one yeah. of their other guys that are like on the bubble They've got too many players, and that's what I've always said about OKC. It's great that you have like 35 draft picks over the next uh, seven years because that's, I think, the total they have, 35. Oh, like, is that real? That's It's really 35? No, that's, that's just, real. Yeah. No, yeah, over crazy. the next seven years between sec first and second round picks, and I think second uh, first round picks, they're up to like 17. So like it's like, what are you going to do with those? Well, first of all, you can trade them and, and go get better players, hopefully. But a lot of those picks aren't good picks. A lot of them are are dump picks or they're picks with really good teams that actually don't have much value, like the 26 pick in the draft. That doesn't have a ton of value. It does have value in the fact that you can 
dump a, a contract with $25 million left on it that's, using that. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So those, they have value, but um, I think that it, it like the way that the Kings manage their roster situation last year was really interesting. I mean, we saw DJ Stewart sign and get waived before the start of camp. So they were able to give him a, 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 a bonus and then waive him. So he would stick around and play in the G league. And we might see that again with this team where, you know, again, like an Alex O'Connell, maybe you want Alex O'Connell to stick around. So you give him a 75,000 or $125,000 bonus and then you waive him whether he shows up at camp or not you you cut him but he still gets that money he's already part of your G League system so he goes right to your G League as long as he doesn't picked up by someone else so those are ways that you can you can manipulate sort of this 21 man roster at this point um and then like there might be veterans that you know like look if we're still we're 2 weeks 3 weeks from now a month from now and guys like Kelly Oubre still don't have a contract. Maybe you do say, Hey, look, uh, we would talk about a, a league minimum deal with you. And maybe that opportunity makes sense to him at that point. And uh, again, I don't know how a guy who averaged 20 points a game last season needs to build value, but if he's not on a roster, he's not on a roster. So again, there are plenty of ways that you can use those. Uh, you can use your roster spaces and all that stuff. So what Sean's talking about with Jordan Ford, again, keep in mind that like Jordan Ford is a local kid. So like there's going to be a lot of murmurs around Sacramento about, you know, wh what's going on with him. But Sean is about as tapped in as you're going to get. So Sean's telling you he's going to be at training camp. He's going to be at training camp. So we'll just leave it at that. So at a, at a minimum, but there's also a possibility that, he doesn't make a regular team and he doesn't have a two-way contract, but if you gave him a certain amount of money, then he's going to go to your G league and stick around. And then maybe you can bring him up sometime during the season. I also think there's a possibility that the Kings won't carry 15 rostered players that they'll stay at 14 in case a two for one happens later in the season or a, a three for two happens where you don't, you want to have an open roster spot or a team like OKC has to dump a player because they need to get underneath the cap and they say, or they need to they need to clear a space and like okay hey we'll give you a second round pick for player X because we like him and we're gonna bring him in or how about you give us a second round pick and we'll take on that player so there are ways that the Kings can use their roster spaces and stuff like that so don't don't get too tied in just remember it's 21 this year as opposed to 20 and that includes your two way contracts and your roster players and then anyone else that you bring in so if that makes sense. Yeah, and to that point too, it's like I can see a fan who may not be totally versed in all this and go, "Well, why would they leave an open roster spot?" And you kind of illustrated that perfectly, James. But it's also you don't have to go very far back. They did that this past season. Uh, you know, they had an open roster spot leading into the the, the trade deadline. So uh, just all kinds of uh, all kinds of possibilities, and um, that that doesn't mean that a team is being cheap by any means. It's 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 making sure that you maximize potential and being able to, you know, you've got irons and fires and when they strike, they strike and they were able to, you know, bring in PJ Dozier at that point. And after they traded for Kessler Edwards and, you know, obviously they had had discussions about other moves, but when it all kind of, uh, you know, kind of settled down, you had a couple 10 day contracts that came in. So, uh, and PJ Dozier ended up sticking around for the rest of the year. Well, and Kessler Edwards is a one where you took Kessler Edwards contract and, got right. something for it like Correct. you actually got value with him not just as a player but you actually got monetary value back from brooklyn because they needed to get under the luxury tax and you save them money by giving up his two million dollar salary brennan go ahead yeah i'll also just say i think it's important to see and i like to see them rewarding their their g league guys you know we saw it last year with um dj stewart deontay burton coming up for a 10 day um, mentioning Jordan Ford and some of these other guys, because I, I think it's so important for those guys to that are in Stockton to have the thought that if I play well, the upper club is going to give me a chance. And I think that they're showing that to some of these other guys. And I think that's really important. And, and my last thought on summer league to kind of put a bow on it is some of these guys will probably end up making their way to Stockton. You know, we saw that last year with um, Jariah Horn, Alex O'Connell, some of these other guys, um, and I, I think we could see some of these other guys at the end of the bench ending up in, in summer league, ending up at Stockton as well. Yeah. A guy like Mike Dom is a guy that 
like there are limitations with a guy. Okay, so there just quickly, there are two different types of, of players. So there are players like uh, like Alex O'Connell that was part of your system and Jordan Ford that were part of your system last year. So if you bring them to camp and you give them $125,000 bonus to show up to camp, but then you cut them, they get to keep that money, especially you can put stipulations if they stick around long enough. If it's a player that hasn't gone through the G League draft and you don't own the rights to him as a G Leaguer, there's a cap. And I think the cap is, we ran into this with Shima Moneki last year. It might only be 25000 that you can give him as an Exhibit 10 contract. And if he makes over that, you can't allocute him to your G League. Then he's got to go through the draft process, and then you can go and try to get him in the draft. Um, but it's like with Shima last year, they had given him too much money up front. And when they went to waive him, they had no option to keep him in Stockton at all. They could not sign him to Stockton at all, even though he had played for Stockton. He wasn't, he played for them as a non Stockton Kings rostered player. He played for them as a Sacramento King. And those are two separate entities. If he would have been on the Stockton Kings first and then uh, on the Sacramento Kings, then you could have like put him back there, but they couldn't do that. Um, so again, there's some complexities of the G League and how it works. And, and I think they're trying to clarify a lot of that. And I love that they're doing a third two way contract at this point. Um, but let's get back to the Sean's quality of depth conversation, because I, I think this is the, the biggest question. I think that if we look at the roster today and we compare it to last season's roster last season, if something happened to Harrison Barnes, this team was shot. I think we all know that like Harrison Barnes plays 82 games, but if you would have lost Harrison Barnes for 20 games, this team had no replacement for Harrison Barnes. They just didn't. Uh, you know, Keegan hadn't proven that he could play the three long enough. Maybe you would have slid uh, Kevin Herter over. I think this team this year is still, they have a lot more depth. Adding Sasha, having the, you know, multi-positional players like like Kevin, who can go back and forth between the two and the three, uh, but also Kessler Edwards, who can play the three and the four. Harrison Barnes, who can play the three and the four. Uh, Keegan Murray can play the three and the four. Uh, Trey Lyles can play the four and the five. Um, you know, you get to some players like Sasha. I, I think he's just a four. He can't really do the other things, but still having him there. If you have him there and you had Harrison Barnes go down, now you can move Keegan Murray over to the three and Sasha Vizenkov can move into the starting lineup for a stretch or Trey Lyles can move into. So my point is that I think the depth is better overall, especially more talent, everything else. You throw in Chris Duarte into that conversation where he helps shores up your your two and your three even more than it was before. Um, but I still think that the Kings have the same problem that they that every team who has star-level players is that if Domana Sabonis or De'Aaron Fox go down, now we're talking about another situation where I think that they would be in trouble. And so I think it just leads to a, a, a like a more in-depth uh, conversation on like the quality of depth and how do the Kings survive a situation like that? Because they use these players as such tremendous hubs to their offense. Yeah, I don't, I don't, the, the one that scares me the most is for the Kings is losing Sabonis because uh, you can, you can go small, you can go small all day, but uh, you'll go up against a lot of teams with length and uh, that's, that's going to be really difficult. That's going to be a difficult challenge. I think, you know, losing Fox is, 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 uh, is, is awful as well, but I feel like you're better equipped to handle that than you are um, losing somebody like Domas for an extended period of time. And, and I think you saw that uh, even in this past year, you know, when, when Fox had the ankle injury and, and Domas had the thumb and granted he didn't, he missed really any time. I think he missed one played game, 80. right? Yeah, yeah. Played so 80. You know, him him uh, realizing that the, that the team really needed him. Um, so, yeah, those are those are two big areas of concern. But uh, I think the biggest one would be if you were to lose Domas. So, uh, you do anything you can with uh, fingers crossed, toes crossed. You know, pray to whatever God you believe in and hope that he doesn't go down. I think most teams, you could say, if their stars went down, they'd be in a tough sure. spot. Um, a, a lot of teams have decent backups, but like if you go, like Tyus Jones, probably one of the better backups in the league, and luckily he gets to step in for John Morant, right? But I think that's an outlier scenario, typically. Like I've been meaning to do an exercise of looking through some of the other star bigs and who their backups are, but just off the top of my head, like Joel Embiid has Montres Harrell behind him, 
right? Bam Adebayo has had Cody Zeller behind him. Um, you look at Jokic behind him, they were playing Jeff Green at the center, like maybe Jamichael Green. There's some Zeke Najee um, behind Anthony Davis. We're talking about uh, Jackson Hayes at this point, like backup centers behind the stars typically, or even just your backups to your stars typically are not somebody that right. you want to put a lot of finances into. And because of that, they're going to be lesser players. Um, and I do think they got depth at the other positions. You know, we, we've talked about it like Duarte. Um, I'm a big fan of Sasha. Maybe Colby can get you a little bit. Maybe Kessler is more comfortable in the system. So I think there's a little bit more depth there specifically going from TD to Duarte. And I think Mezzi to Vizenkov are, are two substantial upgrades to me when it comes to depth. Um, but we heard Mike Brown very bluntly last year talking about searching for that backup center spot. And it's the same guys here. Like Nerland's Noel doesn't solve that. Uh, they're, they honestly didn't get killed in the non Sabonis minutes in the way that maybe it felt like just going off on and off numbers, but you still have that same concern, but really you're just relying on your stars, which I think is always the case. Yeah. But I mean, I, I get what you're saying. Um, I just think that the way that they use Sabonis is so specific. Um, and it's the same thing with the way that they use Jokic. So it's one thing if you have a lesser player at a position. It's another thing if you don't have the same uh, a player who has a similar skill set. You know, and, and again, it's the reason why uh, I know I'll, I'll just beat a dead horse here. It's the reason why I, I always push for Mason Plumley because it's not that Mason Plumley is anywhere near as good as Demonte Sabonis, but he can pass. He can run the offense. You can run the offense through him. Um, and and so I think that there's, you know, again, some of these teams, they do have players. But even with Nerlens, it, it comes back to the same situation that I think that my problem with Nerlens Noel is that it, it doesn't matter what his skill set is. If he's not good enough to beat out the other guys in front of him, um, it doesn't he can't be a rim protector if he's sitting on the bench. There is no basket on the bench that you protect. Um, so, you know what I mean? It's like. Again, people uh, out there, they want to go out and chase Mo Bamba or Bull Bull when they were available. It's like, okay, well, first of all, Bull Bull beat out Mo Bamba. Mo Bamba is what, the sixth pick in the draft and got beat out by a non-roster, you know, like invitee in Bull Bull. Um, that's one thing. And so Bull, and, and that's on a bad team. So Mo Bamba wasn't able to earn minutes on a bad team as a top 10 pick. What would make you think that he'd earn minutes on a, on a good team? like the Sacramento Kings. And you could say, well, the skill set's different, whatever. But I would still make the same argument. And then again, Bull Bull, he, he just got waved by a bad team, a team that isn't good in the Orlando Magic. And so what would make you think that he's going to be a difference maker for you? And uh, that's where functional players, you got to find functional players that actually fit roles and know how to do something specific if they're going to be hiding on a, a bench of a you know 50-win team. And I think that's where the Kings kind of hope that they will be um and now so, he's now he's now bull bulls in phoenix <laughs> on a good team right well he's on in phoenix on a good team but will right. bull bull play at all will he make it out of training camp will he make it you know it, it, yeah. would he be a back end could he does he have two-way eligibility uh I, I think he'd be in his third year yeah yeah he might have two-way eligibility it's kind of like the I mean, did he have injuries that cost him early? Uh, he did, right? I think he did have a an. Well, he played season. in. He played a significant portion uh, last year. Not this in this because he played seventy games of yeah seventy games, and then he only played in fourteen games mm. with the Nuggets in twenty one twenty two. So he's not technically eligible because he played right. in the nineteen twenty season. No injury. Yeah, he's got four seasons, so yeah, there's no injury for him. Uh, unlike the Harry Giles, I mean, it is the Harry Giles rule. Um, right. You know, guys who miss their entire season, wait, like Nerlens Noel also missed his entire first season. Um, yeah, so but I mean, we'll have to see how how it all develops in the end. But uh, but again, I'm I'm not sure that Nerlens gives you something that you didn't have. And and the one thing I would point out too, we talk about the same guys in the rotation. The Kings really didn't use Trey Lyles as a small ball commit to using Trey Lyles as a small ball five. And I think they will commit to using Trey Lyles as small ball five this year, because I think promises were made to Sasha Vizenkov about rotational positions, uh, his spot in the rotation. And I also think that uh, you paid Trey Lyles $8 million a year. 
you didn't pay him eight million dollars a year to go to not play. And, and <laughs> well, some the cynical side of someone could go, well, they did that to Rashawn Holmes, but of course, you obviously traded for Sabonis after giving him that deal. I will also say too, like it's funny when you go, you know, sometimes they'll people look at a roster and it's like, man, they they need a defensive player, they need somebody out there, and you know, you see somebody like Davion who's part of the regular rotation and. Uh, guy like Keon Ellis who plays really well and people want to see him play. It's like, it has to make sense. It has to still benefit your team from an overall product. And they're much like James uh, alluded to earlier, having somebody like Nerlens Noel, who sometimes is on the floor and is just a negative uh, waiting for him to do something big on the defensive end, but also just hurting the overall product of the rotation isn't worth bringing him in just to see if he can get a stop or two. So um something to bear in mind when if, if in the event he ends up on the roster and you're like, man, they, they could use some rim protection right about now. And he's still just sitting there on the bench. Yeah. And, and I'll point out to the one other issue that I think that he kind of fits Nerlens Noel is that uh, you have a really, really good downhill pick and roll specialist and Malik monk that likes to throw a lob to somebody and you no longer have his lob threats. Um, and so maybe Nerlens would work in that situation. Maybe he would look better next to Sasha Vizenkov than Trey Lyles in certain situations because he is a better defensive player. And he, he can track and help somebody else out. Um, so there, there are reasons why he could make sense in Sacramento. I, I'm just not sure that he's a, a mover of the needle. Um, he seems like a really good uh go ahead and give him a, a, a look and see if there's anything there. And if not, you move on pretty quickly. I also, because he's played for like, again, this is the seventh team. There has to be some situation where he played for one of these coaches uh, and where they would be willing to like say, Hey, like thumbs up. Although I'm not sure that I can piece him together with any one of the Kings. I coaching. Think of it. Yeah. No. I so. think he played with HB in Dallas. Oh, Okay. Maybe it's the closest I got. I don't know if you're picking up the phone to call Harrison Barnes during the off season saying, Hey man, <laughs> well, that was just a, gonna, wh- he had which... more upside then than he does now, <laughs> you know, with due yeah. respect. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 yeah so, know. all right. Uh, let's get to the business of basketball. Oh boy. Sean hates oh. this because, uh, why? Because I, we had already discussed this before. Um, oh, are yeah. they done? <laughs> you idiot. <laughs> are they I love done? doing this. Are they done? <laughs> um, Sean, uh, like it is the question, right? Like you're at well, 13, not... 13 yeah. maybe 14 roster spots. Is there is there anything left on, on that trademark? I mean, on the free agent market. Uh, do you think that they get involved in one of these uh, barn burners? Because the league is very unsettled at this point with the Damian Lillard thing hanging out there. The James Harden, like just saying, yeah, he's going to show up to camp, but he, he wants to play for the Los Angeles Clippers. Um, Like all of these weird things that are happening around the league. Let me, let me pivot a minute. Let me ask you guys something. Pivot. 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 That's from friends. Brent, Brendan, not a great series, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Very, it was very popular. It was just overrated. Um, do, do you, th- what do you guys think of these, um, quote unquote superstars, Lillard, Harden, wanting out, having a destination in mind? Um, but you're the team. I mean, we saw this with Kawhi Leonard for the longest time when he wanted out, and, uh, you know, Spurs weren't necessarily in a hurry to move him. Uh, he ended up in Toronto. They won a championship, right? Uh, that's how the story goes. But then and he you're, leaves. You're, but then he left, right? So if you're if you're Dame Lillard, right, and, and you're and you're Joe Cronin up in Portland, are you in a hurry to move him to Miami, where you're ultimately not getting really what you want? I guess my question is: Do you feel as an organization you owe it to the player to facilitate a trade like that? Now, I would say that the the best part of moving him to Miami is that he's no longer in your conference or division, so you're not going to have to face him. Uh, many times to where he can hurt you deliberately like that. But uh, this is a guy who's in the you know very prime of his career. Uh, maybe maybe just if he's reached the peak, maybe it's just kind of 
right? This skosh over the apex. Uh, where do you guys fall on that? Because uh, I've been kind of kicking it back and forth and asking people. And if I'm betting on this, like I think we have resolution at some point uh, before training camp with Damian Lillard, but there's a weird part of me that doesn't think it's going to be the Miami heat. Certainly I think the heat could be involved if you get some more teams involved, but um, I don't know. I do not think you owe it to the player. Um, I think that it is within that player's, you know, right to go publicly and say they want to go to that team. They can pull some of their strings to try to discourage other teams from trading for them um, and things like that. But I, I don't think it should ever come down to the organization has to trade him to this one spot because that's what he wants. I think you owe him um, like updates throughout the course of this. You could talk to him about like, hey, dude, listen, we have these three offers we really like. None of them are Miami. Um, let's say hypothetically, right? But these are three places that we like and we think they're all about even. Is there one that you prefer amongst this? Um, hmm. So I think like you can have conversations with him and keep him involved without it being so black and white, like you're going to Miami. And my two cents is I think that should be understood from the player's standpoint as well, is that like, you know, it, it's not that simple. We can't just trade you to one team. And Miami's package is fine when it comes to the deal. Um, it's okay. It's not great. I think you uh, can get is it, something Is it better. fine? It's okay it because there's a lot of draft picks and there is one good young player. Like it's not just dog shit. It, it's not good necessarily. It's not good. It's I, I'm with you there. It's not good. It's fine. Yeah. Um, for Dame Lillard. It, yeah. Yeah. On on yeah, a huge deal. A little later in his career. Like, I think that you owe it to them to have them be a part of the conversations, but certainly not to the extent of like, yeah, we're going to move you to the one team that you want and just screw all our leverage and what we get back. Yeah. I'm kind of with Brendan here. Like I, I think it's well within the player's rights to say, look, we gave this a shot. I'm 33. I, I want to, I want to try to finish out my career the right way. But the problem that you have is when you trade a player like this to a team like the Miami heat who are historically good, who have a great system in place and who were in the NBA finals last year and who like very well will be in the NBA finals a couple more times over the next three to four years. If you do allow Damian Lillard to go there is that any draft capital you get from that team now sucks. Like it, it's one thing to trade him to a team that you think you might be able to get some, like if I'm, if I'm uh, the, the blazers, man, I, I want the best package of young players possible. Yep. I don't want draft picks because your draft picks suck. Like go to a team that has a good young player, a really good young player that you think fits what you're trying to do. And no disrespect to Ty Tyler Hero, but you know, we always have this thing, right? That Monty McNair comes from the, uh, the Daryl Morey tree of thought when it comes to paying your own free agents. Well, that tree of thought is not the Miami heat. The Miami heat repeatedly overpay their own free agents. They give way too much money out to players that don't end up living up to that contract at all. And I'm not saying that Tyler Harrow won't live up to his contract, but it's a lot of money for a player who may or may not ever move the needle. Can, you know, can I he, point something out about Tyler Harrow real quick? Yeah. He's the guy that got hurt and your team went to the finals. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't really say anything about it. Though, does I, well, it? it does. It sure it does. Sure it does. It, especially the team of the Heat, who you know, let's face it, they they weren't high in the East. Um, they went through a road, you know, and, and you know, I mean, they're they're really also putting their chips in this, all their kind of eggs in this basket to to try to get uh, Dame Lillard. The problem is, you just don't really have a, a an attractive enough package to, to to get it done in my opinion i'm not i don't mean that as disrespect to tyler hero i'm saying that if you're if that's your golden goose in the trade in the trade that ain't shit I mean, when you got dame lillard you know? i agree uh, and, I, I, and, and i think that the, the the reason i bring it up and, and brendan i'm actually with you guys both of you guys you don't owe it to the player at all you do have a legacy player in lillard right where the, he's played so long for your your team um, it's like a Mitch Richmond scenario in a little bit of ways. If you go yeah. back enough in King's history where, you know, shoot, he was the, the, the underappreciated, the underrated. He was in, he was all Sacramento had, he was the all-star. Um, but 
it, it reached it reached a point of no return at that point. You know, he gets hurt and you try to get something for him. The fact that they got Chris Weber for him is an absolute coup um, because he was no he had one more good year and that was about it in Washington. So um, it, Lillard will be a little bit different because he's going to go somewhere and still be outstanding. Um, the Harden thing is way different because he's not that le- bit more sense i think the package you could probably get for for james harden at least in the immediate is probably more possibly more attractive than what you can get from miami that that could probably be debated but um if if i'm the trailblazers though i'm having a hard time because look i think a lot of a lot of these trades are facilitated by agents anyway a lot of the agencies will do uh, a lot of the legwork on a lot of these types of moves and it's like okay if you've identified where you want to go well, find me a pathway that's suitable for me to make that trade if I'm Portland. And if I tell Aaron Goodwin, uh, Dame Lillard's agent, I would say, go find me that deal, you know, because as the deal that I have right now, it's not good enough. And I, like you mentioned, Brendan, I might have two or three other deals that I might rather like to make, but out of respect to your client, if you can find me a better deal, then then I'll do it. Fortunately, they've got a good portion of the off season left to where, you know, you're not, there's no, you know, gun to your head you have to get this done so um training camp is still what two months away so uh, i think you have time but i do feel you know there's going to be this odd moment where if he doesn't end up in miami what could the ramifications of that be uh meaning that does that hurt does that hurt like will team will other teams do likewise will they go out and try to facilitate for the player will they uh, think twice about trying to move a guy to just a, a preferred destination or do what's best for the team. I, I feel t- in my mind that they try to do what's best for the team more times than not. Um, even if it does involve a legacy player. Yeah. I, if I'm the Blazers, I, I don't even know what to do. Like y- you need young players that are good. That's what you need. You don't need, right. you don't need a guy who's a system guy and hero that's let's pumped up his stats because he played in a system that allowed him to do that. You need a player that is, you know, legitimate, or you need, you need to tell Miami, you need to get me a couple of lottery picks. I'm, I'm not taking your back end of the draft stuff. You know, right. you need to package those things up and, and go get me some sort of, if you can get lottery capital, that's one thing. And that's the thing. Like I, the Blazers chose a path not this last summer, but the summer before when they hired Mike Schmitz as their assistant GM. I think it's a brilliant move because I look at their roster now and I see players that are really, really intriguing young players, draft players, because Mike is one of the best in the business when it comes to knowing everything about all the young players. He, you know, was the ESPN guy, but before that draft express forever, like he really is smart. He, he has scouted every player around the world okay, like give him some opportunity here to keep doing that. Give him a list. I'm sure he has a list of players that he would say, okay, I want this player and this player and this player. Go try to find those guys that are already on NBA rosters. Go find a pathway to get me those players, and I'm okay with the Damian Lillard thing if we're going to reboot yeah. here. And like so. like Bradley, if people, are, someone might be listening, let's go, wait a minute, Bradley Beal just got his preferred destination. There's a big difference there that he had a no trade clause that he was willing to uh wave to be moved to a spot and to, for for washington that was essentially addition by subtraction uh for them at that point so um yeah it's just it's just interesting wondering like what teams will do like if you had do you guys do either of you think he ends up in miami oh yeah i think Talking there's always Lillard, a path um, i think there's always a path I, yeah but if you were to like ballpark it do you think that's the the what you think will happen i'm gonna go with no but it's a coin flip. Yeah, it's, it's I, I'm going to say there's still a possibility. Like, and I, I don't like that. I, I don't like it that that's like unless you can really go get him something. You know, like it, there is a deal out there. Like I, I've said this before, there is a deal for the Miami Heat to make a, a trade with the Portland Trailblazers that makes sense for Portland, and that's that you give up Bam out of bio. It doesn't <laughs> yeah, make sense for that. Miami. They're not going right. to do it. They're not they going to do it. That. But that's where if you're Miami, you're saying, "Hey, I I want him, but I'm gonna give you like my my B's and my C's here on the roster." And Portland saying, "No, we want an A. 
an A-lister for this, or we want a 22, 23 year old stud that's up and coming that everyone knows is going to be good. And you're not offering that. Or Tyler hero gets flipped and it's like a three team. And you're talking about what, what can you get up to seven first round picks? Like, I guess, but seven, I, I, I get, maybe that makes sense. I, and where would Tyler Hero make sense to go to do that that flip? Like, right? Yeah, it's interesting stuff. And and I think there's a lot of previous stuff in years that just makes this conversation so weird. Like, I think back to like Isaiah Thomas getting traded from Boston right after playing through uh, injury, and that was like a horrible look for Boston. And everybody's like, "Oh my God, they're gonna screw themselves in in future negotiations." They've done fine overall. Right. I, I think that lingered for about a year. Um, and then I, I think of on, on the other side, Daryl Morrow holding on to Ben Simmons as long as he did. And, you know, I was kind of rolling my eyes at that. He got James Harden for Ben Simmons like that paid off. It was very much worth it in the end. Well, um, I'm not sure that it it did. Well, but James Harden maybe didn't pan out the way you wanted, but the idea I mean, of what James Ben Harden. Simmons was like they were very close to the finals this year. You know, I mean, they were very they. they yeah that that playoff series could have gone a different way and probably should have gone a different way. Um, yeah. I just I think know. like, if I'm, if I'm Portland, like, all right, I'll take Tyrese Maxey. And they're like, we don't want to give him up. I'm like, okay, well then you're not getting Damian Lillard. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. There's, there's so many scenarios. I just, you know, I, it just makes me wonder and back to the business of basketball question where you say, are they done? It's like, well, these are the types of things that can kind of, you know, or if they're, if you're attaching another team to there, I think, um, you know, if anyone read Monty McNair's conversation with the athletic with Anthony Slater and Sam Amick, I think there's a couple of things to take away from there, but, but the biggest thing is, you know, they've got some movable pieces. They've got some real flexibility. And I think they're, you know, they're, they're pretty ecstatic to have some of their people locked up for long term, especially their, their key pieces. And all the while Keegan Murray, their rookie from last year who's making these big, big strides. But, you know, you have all your first round picks with the exception of the one coming up this year that's lottery pro- or that's has some protections to it. Um, that'll likely yeah, go to Atlanta. Team. Yeah. Yeah. Going to it, likely going to Atlanta. And, and, but you've got all your picks at your disposal and you've got a, most, I mean, you have so many second round picks that are still at your disposal as well. So they're positioned really, really well to be able to strike when the iron's hot. It's just all about how you, define what how define the temperature of that of that iron of said iron like how hot does it have to be and if, if you're making a tertiary move is that your definition of being striking while the iron's hot um i i think you you even look at someone like harrison barnes this deal that he signed i think is very team friendly um i think a lot of the contracts that they have moving forward are very very team friendly so there's uh there's a lot of possibilities that could open up really, really quickly. But I also feel that, you know, this, the other thing you take from that conversation is this season be damned. Like they're looking beyond this season. They're looking at the next few seasons. So this is part of that. Um, But, you know, it's not like you have to throw uh, all your hope into that one season of like, Hey, we were third last year. Uh, let's see if we can build upon that and be better. And uh, we have to throw all caution to the wind to try to be that championship team. It's like, well, no, you've got several years of hopefully being able to sustain that and maybe rise to that occasion. It doesn't have to necessarily be this year. It's refreshing. Yeah, it, really, it is refreshing because like for so many years it was, Oh, we got, we have to break the streak. So the Kings made moves that really didn't make sense. Just trying to break the, this, the, uh, the playoff drought. And that's what it felt like. Like even when they're doing it, it's like, okay, well this one has a chance to end the playoff drought and they never did. So I, from this point on though, it's like, you don't have to improve. You don't, I mean, you hope that they improve, but you don't have to. Um, the goal is to start stringing together playoffs and start building on your playoff trajectory, you know, not taking some gigantic, uh, swing. You don't, you already made your big swing and you already locked up all your roster space and, uh, and, and all your, your core. Now, how do you improve on that core? And that's going to be like, it's, it's easier to have movable pieces like that, um, to build something when, when you do have, you know, pieces that you can move. Like even this off season, you walked into the off season with seven players under contract that that's really difficult to make a trade 
when you only have seven players under contract. <laughs> like you didn't have anything really to trade. Like, so outside of, you know, you, you start naming your, your core group. Okay. Well now they've got like 13 guys on, on under contract. And most of those guys, like even the, uh, like Harrison Barnes, he can be moved six months after his contract extension was signed. So like early January, everyone is eligible to be traded before the, uh, uh, before the trade deadline. And, and that's, you know, it's kind of an interesting way that they've, they've built their team where if they, if that big move does come up, if there is something that they need to like change trajectory of who they are or something gets brought to them, they have the opportunity to do it, the assets to do it. So, yeah, for sure. They are in a spot to, uh, you know, maybe be advantageous if they find something come up like, like the Duarte or, or Kessler Edwards or maybe something bigger. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um, okay. Well, I, I think we've been going for, uh, for an hour and 15 hour and 16 minutes here. Uh, thanks for sticking with us here on the King's beat. Um, if you're still watching and you don't mind and you haven't already, give us a thumbs up. Um, you let's, already. yeah. And you haven't already, uh, let's get to, uh, let's get to final thoughts. Um, you know, we're, we're in the dog days of summer. Uh, it's hot outside. I mean, right now I, I have it at, up here. It's 96. I'm sure it's close to hundred or above hundred, uh, down in the, uh, Sacramento metropolitan area. Um, but, uh, Brendan, do you have any final thoughts today? Um, and looking at Nerland's Noel's stat line, uh, basketball reference, I saw a nickname, uh, the Nerland wall and oh, I hate yeah. it. horrible, horrible, horrible. <laughs> Why? Stop. The Nerland wall. Really? Stop. Yeah. What do you not like about no, it? No, because it's a play on the Berlin guy? wall. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. But like Brennan, the Berlin wall was, uh, something that <laughs> divided the two Germanys and now there's just East Germany, Germany and West Germany. Yeah. <laughs> It, they, they, it's a Ronald stretch Reagan to connect that to down defense, that wall. Guys. I don't know. Well, right. I mean, it's separating one Germany from the next. So in the in the way he's separating the the he's separating the ball mm. from the basket. So I can I can see it. It's not a great nickname. It's not Nerlin Nerlins, and they take off the S and it rhymes with Berlin. Maybe I don't know. It's not a great nickname. <laughs> I, I think it's funny that this one stuck with you, Brennan. You're like, yeah, what you is really happening? pissed off about it. I wasn't I even you... that mad. Well, but I tweeted something and everybody did the typical Sean, like, well, you see, this is what the Berlin Wall is. I'm like, guys, I know they what did? the Berlin Wall is. <laughs> oh. I just, yeah. Yes. Nice. Connecting those dots is, yeah, creative, I guess. I don't know. Not a fan. I mean, I, I, I okay. Okay. I also came to realize in this process that Keegan needs a nickname and tried to ask Twitter. And the most common answer has been Threegan Murray, which eh. no, I don't like that. Eh. Eh. No, there's, there's no real nickname right now, though. Keeg um, Keegs. Does that count? Sure. Does it not? S the silent assassin. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah. like that at all. That gets, <laughs> makes, yeah. That well, he doesn't say cool. a word, though. He does. He's getting a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> what did I <laughs> talkative? I, I no? sent you one, right, Brendan? Um, uh you did. That's right. Uh, yeah. What did I send you? Um, let me Where see. Uh, I mean, the melancholy menace. The melancholy menace. <laughs> Murray, the melancholy some, menace. Uh, I'm trying to think of something I, with wiggle because they've loved this word with him. But no, let's can't, please. Not. Part of the wiggles or something. Anymore. Yeah. No. Uh, what did Luke called him? Vanilla. <laughs> oh yeah. no. I, I like don't know that. that that's okay. And he he described himself the same way. So like, hey, vanilla. That rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yeah. I actually like vanilla. Uh, I don't know. Vanilla is not horrible. We're gonna need the that's chat not. to help out. Comments. Get on. Uh, it. Yeah, comments. Oh, get, so we're not get live. On. God, get I forgot on. about that. We're not live. Yeah, we're not live today. Um, okay, uh, show, Sean, Sean. Do you have any final thoughts? Yeah. Uh, sure. I, I spent the morning in Stockton with a cool um, uh, kind of a charity food distribution uh, event that the Stockton Kings were part of. It happens basically in this Stockton community, South Stockton community, like once every third Thursday, I think it is. But this uh, this group that the Stockton Kings had partnered with uh, have done a really, really nice job of um helping people less fortunate in the Stockton region. And I want to make sure I give the 
the group their proper shout out. It's called Second Harvest, and this event was called King's 209 Pantry Distribution. And uh, Jordan Ford was down there, Anjali Ranadive was down there, and they were. Uh, it's kind of cool to see like this visual of literally cars that are just <laughs> pulling up into this um, into this school recreation area. And they just fill up your your trunk with 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 food for some of these people who are part of this uh, organization, and and um, who, you come through and they they receive support from them, and uh, just kind of a cool way to see uh, a community effort helping some people who can certainly use it um, at a time that you know obviously times are hard throughout the year, but it, this isn't tied to the holidays. And that's kind of one of the things I like to see about it. So it was really interesting seeing them. You see cars. I mean, they're mile down the road for blocks uh in this in this community and uh they, there were some a lot of smiling faces out there and kudos to them and the king staff uh for for putting that on and uh it's kind of really cool to see and get out in the community and try to beat the heat as well because it was uh i know it's going to be a little warm but i like the warmth i like the warmth of the sun in these uh summer days just don't get just don't get above like a hundred you know if it's 90s i think that's fantastic I did like the dip in temperature this week where like it was high 80s, or low 90s. I'm OK there. I'm not OK when you walk outside to like take the dogs out to do their business and it just like punches you in the face. You're like, what is happening? You know, the best part, though, is the evenings, man. They really cool off. The state fair is going on right now. I don't know if either of you are going to go out to that. Nope. Um, they had Jenny not going to happen. There. Ashanti is there next week. Mm. Um, you know, some other names out there. Leanne Rhymes, I remember seeing so. Uh, Sean, I'll be on the lake. You'll be That's, on the lake. Yeah. I'm going to be on the lake. I get it. Yeah. I get it. It's, it's much cooler on the lake than uh, just the water itself. The water temperature is around like high 70s, low 80s. So it drives the temperature around you down. So that's good. Would you have gone to see Boys to Men, either of you? Brendan has no idea who that is. I but, would consider uh, Boys the, to Men. Yeah. I would consider name. that. Excuse you. You've heard the name. I can't name a song off the top of my head, but I bet you I know oh, a lot of words to a couple God. of them. Wow. There's an album called Two. It is phenomenal. Yeah, I think you should listen to that. Top to bottom. Yeah, you know their songs. Like I'm sure the, I do. End of the road, name. right? On bended knee, end of the road. I'll make yeah. love to you. Water runs dry. Come on now. Could've Cooley High the, Harmony, Motown you, Philly. But... Well, I wasn't saying it to you, pal. It's the name of the song. I didn't say you were. Oh, <laughs> 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 oh the education of Brenda Nunes. <laughs> So Boys hard to, to say men. goodbye. Come on now. Yeah. Uh, and there's uh, only three of them now. The the other guy, the guy with the real deep voice, if you listen to the albums, he's not the Michael McCrary. He's not there anymore. What happened to him? Uh, he, remember, he always had the cane. I think touring got to be too much for him. So it's just oh. uh, Nate, Mike, Sean, Wanya. I think they opened up the fair this year. So I think I had to go uh, to that. Like, I was a little pissed I couldn't make it. I think they sang uh, like during the finals or something. Like I've oh, seen yeah. them at National like, Anthems. In, a, in a basketball setting. Yeah. So um, welcome to boys right. to men talk. Let's see. Um, outside of that, I, I don't have anything. Uh, I, I love how you look out your window every time you come up with your he final does, thought. Huh? That's I'm, he, every point. time he just, peers I'm just out dreaming. The I'm well, I'm looking at the lake right now and I can see <laughs> like the water sparkling off of it. And I just want to go. How your boats and, doing? Uh, the boats are good. The boats are the, the boats have been strong. The, to the ham strong. Navy. Yeah. um yeah quite uh strong to quite strong and we've been out there quite a bit which is good because you know when you purchase a boat you you want to actually use the boat and sometimes you don't and then you feel guilty about you know having a boat that you're that you pay for that you don't use uh I get that. yeah well you know it is what it's it like is brennan gets his new video game and doesn't play it you know right Kind of same same feeling? exact sure. thing or when you buy a car but then you walk everywhere i'm just saying brendan yeah, yeah same exact thing uh yeah outside of, like I'll, I'll do the public service announcement uh someone else drowned in the in the mm -hmm. river like this weekend like just be super cautious don't go in the in the river um clearly outside not of that, Kingsby like, listener I, I don't, yeah I, I think we um like we're getting to a point there's uh we're gonna do a happy hour next week um uh there's some exciting other things coming up uh that um we'll have for you soon uh as far as things that i'm doing uh things that you know just out and about uh so we'll get to that down the road um and i think i think that's about it 
So like the, we're going to have the dog days of summer here. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to me as Kata. Uh, we don't know if they're going to bring in anyone else for these roster spots, but even if we do see that stuff, it'll slow play. I'm going to try to get back to doing a second podcast every week with a guest. Uh, it just got crazy with summer league and all that stuff. Uh, it always does. So um, plan on seeing some of that stuff coming out, uh, but it should be a, a quiet like six to eight weeks where we're still plugging away here, but uh, we're making up content and, and, and having discussions with you guys out there. Uh, I'll so just say real quick, the city of Portugal, don't hate Sacramento. I, I feel like this is slowly happening. The um, country of Portugal. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I said city. Well, yeah. The country of Portugal. <laughs> yeah. Of Thank course, you. this is the nature of it, but uh, it's not the King's fault. I don't want to, after all the love that we've gotten from Portugal for this to just flip flop so quickly. Uh, I, I will tell you this, like the day that Jimmer got waived by the Kings, I lost 400 Twitter followers in one day. And that's back in the day where that was like 10% of your Twitter following. And that wasn't, that wasn't cool. So the good people of Portugal, we got your back here. We've been supporting you and we'll keep giving you content on Numias Keda, regardless of where he's at. Um, and hopefully good things happen for him, whether it's in Sacramento or elsewhere. So it is what it is. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat podcast. Uh, again, if you're still watching here on YouTube and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. We broke 3,000. Uh, next up, I think we'll make the next mark like 5,000. We can get to 5,000. Uh, and we do all that organically. I'm not purchasing any YouTube followers here to get us up a, some big number. Um, but uh, jump on board with the King's Beat. Go to thekingsbeat.com. Uh, become a premium subscriber to get invites to things like the happy hour, uh, which we will have next week. Um, and outside of that, I don't think we have anything else going on. So uh, for Box 40, Sean Cunningham and Brendan Nunes from the King's Bulls podcast. I am James Ham, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. See you very soon. <laughs>